Greetings, everyone, and good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it may be for you, wherever in the world you are. I'd like to welcome you to the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Lancet International Health Lecture. We are fortunate to have three speakers presenting today's lecture, which will cover global pandemic perspectives on public health, mental health, and lessons for the future. Our speakers are Dr. Matsudisu Moeti, World Health Organization Regional Director for Africa, Professor Helen Herman, Professor at the University of Melbourne and Director of the WHO Collaborating Center in Mental Health, and former president of World, the World Psychiatric Association until last year, and Professor George Gao, Director General of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. We also have with us Professor Richard Horton from The Lancet, who will be chairing the lectures. I'm Frances Brodsky, Professor at University College London and Interim Vice President International of the Academy of, the Me of Medical Sciences. The Academy is the UK's National Academy for Medical Sciences, and our mission is to promote medical science and its translation into benefits for society. This international health lecture provides a platform for leaders in global health to address topics of international significance to promote discussion. The International Health Lecture was established in 2004, and we are delighted that this is now the sixth year it has been held in conjunction with The Lancet. And we thank The Lancet very much for partnering, partnering with us to host this International Health Lecture. Previously, the lecture has taken place in person, but we've been online, of course, for the past two years. However, we are pleased that this means we can engage with a larger audience around the world and welcome back to all of you um, from wherever you are. So I'll just um, describe the order of the program, which will be that we'll have the lecture, which will be about an hour, and then we'll host a question and answer session for approximately 30 minutes at the end. And you can use the chat function to submit questions at the end of the lectures, which and will become open then. And we'll attempt to answer as many as possible during the QA session. So uh, please, um, when you ask your question, if you can, uh, try to remember to put in your name and your affiliation. And I now invite Professor Richard Horton from The Lancet and Fellow of the Academy to provide some introductory remarks and to chair the lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Francis. What an absolute pleasure it is to be uh, co-hosting with the Academy this annual lecture. This is a real highlight of the year for us. I'd like to thank you, Francis, for your leadership. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Anne Johnson, the president of the Academy, for her superb leadership, not only of the Academy, but of um, her leadership of the response to the pandemic. Um, she's been an absolutely wise voice in the media over the past uh, year or so. Um, uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not meeting in person, but this, the uh, silver lining of the fact that we have a virtual event is that we have a much larger international audience. Now I'm speaking from London, uh, and the reality is that we are gathering today at yet another moment of crisis for Europe. Um, I'm afraid that it's our continent at the moment that is at the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. If I take the 53 countries in the World Health Organization's European region, so far there have been around 1.8 million deaths uh, across WHO Euro from COVID-19. Uh, that's the reported figure but the actual figure is probably closer to two and a half million deaths. And if you look from now to the beginning of March next year, uh, it's estimated that there will be an additional 630,000 deaths across the European region. So we are far from the end of this pandemic. The catastrophe continues, I'm afraid. And in many countries in Europe, deaths are rising and rising rapidly. And of course, it's not only about death. We also have, and we're going to hear more about that today, a severe burden of mental ill health and, of course, the burden of long COVID. If we look worldwide, 
um, at what the global burden is of the pandemic. Again, I'm afraid to say that it's worse than reported. The official figures put the total number of deaths from COVID-19 at just over 5 million, but the actual number of deaths is probably going to be around 12 million because many countries simply are under-reporting the number of deaths. So forget the 5 million figure, the reality is it's over double that. So the, the, the catastrophe globally of the pandemic is far worse than you probably already think that it is. Now today we've got three fabulous speakers and Francis has already introduced them who are going to give you uh, three very different perspectives uh, about where we are with the pandemic. Um, so let's get going with that. I would ask you to do one important thing as we're going through, think about the questions you want to ask, because we've got a great opportunity at the end uh, for question and answer sessions. Send your questions in and I will do my best uh, to be able to put them to our three speakers. So let's get going. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Shidi Moetti, who's done such a wonderful job of leading WHO Afro. Uh, Shidi, speaking from Johannesburg, over to you. My warm greetings to colleagues at the Academy of Medical Sciences and The Lancet, to my fellow speakers, Professor Helen Herman and Professor George Gao, and to everyone connecting to this event. It's my great pleasure to share some reflections to set the scene for this conversation on global pandemic perspectives for public health, mental health, and lessons for the future. In particular, I'd like to look at how important it is that the COVID-19 pandemic serve as a world's wake up call to invest, invest in equity and preparedness for sustainable development. I thank professors Francis Brodsky and uh, my friend and colleague Richard Horton for the invitation and the opportunity to join this special global health discussion, which over the years has highlighted the big issues and themes for the future of research and policy. I'd like to start with a broader picture. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the potential for health emergencies to stop sustainable development in its tracks. This crisis has claimed millions of lives and it has wreaked havoc on economies, political parties, global supply chains, businesses, livelihoods, and of course, people their health, including mental health, education, and international travel systems. Any doubt that health is a political choice and a social and economic imperative has surely been dispelled. Yet the global response to Ebola, to H1N1, to SARS and other infectious diseases that have spread internationally, tells us that advocates should continue sounding the alarm of the necessity of investing in preparedness as an integral element of resilient health systems everywhere. Once the horror of this crisis fades, business as usual should not and cannot resume. The lessons from this disruptive period in human history should be taken up by societies across sectors and by health systems and communities to build forward better for more holistic, sustainable development. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that science delivers results. Safe and efficacious vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics have been developed at breakneck speed with international public-private scientific collaboration. The challenge has been making sure that these essential products are distributed fairly and equitably. The local production agenda which has strong political leadership from the African Union and its heads of state, for example, is a key strategy towards ending the delays in accessing life-saving commodities faced by low and middle-income countries, particularly in Africa. The establishment of a messenger RNA technology transfer hub in South Africa, for example, is also opening the door towards the development of vaccines for other priority diseases in African countries like malaria and even HIV. This announcement was followed last month by one from BioNTech that they will be partnering with Rwanda and Senegal 
to set up vaccine manufacturing plants. So the political will around local production is fast becoming a reality. It is clear that the private sector using its resources and networks can play transformative roles in health and development if equity is a guiding principle for partnerships. Strategies to engage large pharmaceutical players in this endeavor are also needed to prioritize people over profits. Merck's indication, for instance, that they will forego royalties on their COVID-19 treatment to boost supply of the drug in 105 low and middle income countries is an example of the kind of equity focused action that other big names could take to help humanity tackle pandemic events. Overall, the inequities witnessed during the COVID-19 pandemic point to the need for updated development models that seek to build local institutional and workforce search capacities and to facilitate progress at an equal pace. An assumption has crept into the global health action that low income countries will progress more slowly than wealthy ones. This thinking needs to be pointed out and challenged by all stakeholders for a fairer playing field and so that low income countries can act with agency. Multilateral mechanisms set up to distribute COVID-19 tools equitably, such as the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX facility, have made important contributions to the global response. These are good starting points for the kind of international solidarity that should be aspired to, acknowledging that there are many aspects to be improved, including better factoring in the risk of prioritizing national self-interest. Indeed, the inconsistency around the catch cry of international solidarity and the limited action that follows it has been one of the biggest surprises of the pandemic. For example, six weeks out from the end of the year, less than 50% of the doses pledged to COVAX for delivery in 2021 have been shipped to African countries. We faced similar challenges before, back when HIV was unfolding and countries at its epicenter in Sub-Saharan Africa were unable to access life-saving antiretroviral therapy. At that time, it was because the treatment was unaffordable. The creation of the Global Fund helped to overcome this by providing financing, centralizing procurement and creating the market. Yet today, the latest antiretrovirals are still unaffordable and debates about pricing are still going on. So how should these issues be addressed if we can predict that concerns of national or commercial self-interest are very likely to arise? This is a key question to consider going forward. It is clear that stronger mechanisms are needed to improve the accountability of governments, companies, and all stakeholders in pandemic preparedness. The International Health Regulations 2005 are the global bedrock of preparedness and response. This legal instrument provides the basis for collaboration between countries and reciprocal responsibility. Over the years, the IHR has hit against some recurring challenges during epidemics, such as failures or delays in information sharing by state parties. During the COVID-19 pandemic, other issues have also emerged, such as problems that arise when there are limited global standards, challenges with early detection, and differing requirements for international travel, international contact tracing, and diagnosis and treatment. Needs for collaborative strategies to ensure equitable access to life-saving products like vaccines, medicines, and other essential supplies have also assumed the spotlight including discussions around sharing intellectual property, know-how and tools to expand global production capacities. Deliberations on these issues are ongoing at the global level and the World Health Assembly will meet later this month to consider whether an international instrument should be negotiated to address the identified gaps towards making sure that the world will be better prepared for the next pandemic threat. Overall, there's recognition that a better system is needed than the one we have now. As WHO, we believe that this should start with a common understanding that all countries share the risks and vulnerabilities to the spread of infectious diseases. 
common standards, incentives, sanctions, and enforcement mechanisms will be critical to improving pandemic preparedness and response in future. Looking ahead, strategies to sustain interest in pandemic preparedness will be needed. The lives lost, huge economic impacts, and reversals in development gains should provide the impetus, but this will require committed political and technical leadership, predictable financing, constant advocacy, innovation, and mechanisms to ensure accountability. Financing will be fundamental. The massive cost to economies of the pandemic response are a strong argument for efficiencies that can be gained by investing in preparedness. Global review groups of the COVID-19 crisis have recommended the need for a global financing facility, which could inject much needed funding and prioritization. It could also create new structures and requirements for countries to access funding. For sustainability, and as momentum builds around discussions to decolonize global health and aid, domestic initiatives and actions should also play a key role. This includes mobilizing government resources for preparedness as part of national development and security in low and middle income countries. At WHO, we have a contingency fund for emergencies, which has been incredibly useful in releasing funding quickly to kickstart response operations. Setting up a similar type of fund at the national level could assist low and middle income countries to minimize delays in making operational funding available. A key lesson that the pandemic has reinforced is the importance of agency among leaders and prioritizing the use of national resources to improve education and health, reduce poverty, and assist populations in emergencies. We've seen over the past 23 months that crises test trust in established institutions, including governments. It's too late to start social reforms when disaster strikes. Mistrust and skepticism have facilitated the rapid spread of misinformation. People have experienced increasing fatigue and frustration as a pandemic has dragged on. These are human behaviors that call for a paradigm shift from biomedical, that is epidemiological and virological models to holistic integration of emotional, psychosocial and anthropological responses. Early last year, we saw that for countries where social safety nets and resilient livelihoods were not in place, temporary measures were introduced with mixed results. Some support benefited businesses without trickling down to workers. Individuals in the informal sector, which account for the majority of workers in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, confronted devastating realities as their means of earning money evaporated. This calls for longer term investments to mitigate and cushion populations from the potential impacts of pandemics, including by engaging big businesses and, as partners in safeguarding livelihoods and protecting households from a range of other issues. Outbreaks start and end in communities, and so they should be engaged as partners in emergency preparedness and response. Attention to equity within countries is central. Equity is a guiding principle and a goal of our work as WHO. We believe that it should be part of the development process before a pandemic starts to create safe working environments, housing, access to basic healthcare, so that people have the capital needed to play their part. Looking forward, a compact between governments and citizens would help to build trust and hold each party accountable for their respective roles. At the level of health systems, We've seen the value of universal health coverage, of every person having access to the care that they need. There are examples in countries at all stages of development of health systems being overwhelmed. This tells us that continuous investment is important, along with the how of this investment, linking it with actions to build preparedness, resilience, and dexterity. The availability of data to guide decision-making is critical. We are scratching the surface of the possibilities of big data, machine learning, and other technologies 
that have the potential to revolutionize surveillance, early warning, timely reporting, and prompt effective response to infectious disease outbreaks. As part of enhancing strategic action, one good practice that has emerged in many countries has been the establishment of high-level multi-sectoral task forces to steer the COVID-19 response. The creation of these mechanisms recognized that an all of society approach was needed. In looking at the composition of these task forces in around 25 African countries, the most commonly represented sectors are health, finance, and security, followed by the interior, social and foreign affairs, telecommunications, trade, and the president's or the prime minister's office. These tend to be the ministries playing key roles in preventing or slowing the spread of a virus and they influence the pandemic's course or trajectory. A few countries also included in their groups other ministries representing sectors that are important to their social and economic development and were heavily impacted as a result of the pandemic, such as tourism, transport, and education. The environmental sector, with its broad role in policy making around climate change with its contribution to vulnerability, will be critical too, especially after the outcomes of the Glasgow COP. As part of enhancing preparedness, countries need to be able to quickly recognize the multifaceted impacts that can be expected and have mechanisms that can be activated rapidly to guide the response. National and global coordination platforms have inevitably brought together politicians, policymakers, and scientific advisors. And there has been a tension to balance between science and politics. Strategies for managing this also need further discussion. Multisectoral coordination is a key approach advocated for many health challenges, such as non-communicable diseases, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis and other issues. So there's an opportunity in the wake of COVID-19 to strengthen multi-sectoral action for health generally. In closing, there are some key thematic themes that have emerged in the context of COVID-19 that can guide efforts going forward to enhance pandemic preparedness and response. The first is around building local capacities, as we have seen how challenging it is to deploy expertise resources and products internationally when the whole world is responding. Local capacities are needed to enhance sustainability and resilience. We aim in WHO in the region to support countries on this, particularly human resources. Financing to safeguard health security is also imperative to save lives and livelihoods and mitigate the impacts of emergencies on populations and economies. Equity should be integrated into all actions so that all communities are empowered to play their part in keeping themselves and others safe. In response to COVID-19, new tools and approaches have emerged rapidly that have proved invaluable. So more needs to be done to incentivize innovation, research, including homegrown solutions tailored to different contexts. Finally, collaboration has been essential to the COVID-19 response and mechanisms are needed to enhance and encourage government ministries, the private sector and communities to play their roles. So with these reflections, I'm pleased to hand over to Professor Herman and I look forward to the discussion today and thank you for your attention. Dr. Moetti, thank you so much. That was uh, absolutely magisterial introduction to our three perspectives and really giving uh, an extremely important um, view from a continent that I'm afraid has yet again been marginalized in the global response to the pandemic. Remember that I think currently only 5% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa has been fully vaccinated and the projection is that even into the early part of next year, it won't be more than around 10%. So a fact that we should be ashamed of as a global community. Now let's move to our second speaker. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, my friend and colleague, Professor George Gao, who is Director General 
of the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He's a professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, and has many other distinguished positions, uh, has played an absolutely central role uh, in the response to the pandemic in China and is a true global voice um, during the course of this emergency. So let me hand over to you, Professor Gao. Hello, everyone. So my talk will be titled Science-Based, Public Evolved, and Administration Sweetly Disease-Made Strategy for Future Pandemic Preparedness. So to do that, it's very important to remember those words here from the very beginning. No passports for viruses. No visa is needed for virus travel. The international cooperation is much more needed. So that's the message I want to deliver from the very beginning. Maybe this is why the Academy of Medical Sciences at the Lancet would like to organize this meeting. Would like you to invite me working in China to join this program. So to do that, it's very important to overview the early investigation for the COVID-19 because as Director General of China CDC, also as a scientist in the Chinese Academy of Sciences, I myself experienced the whole process from the very beginning. So what happened from early investigation? Obviously, you know, there's some, something the end of uh, December, 2019, but you know, when we were noticed uh, the end of December and early January, we immediately did the sequencing, we did the virus isolation within a week. So this is very, very important. This is, you know, um, record breaking uh, speed. We got the virus, we know it's a coronavirus. That's why now everything is reported in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet. And also we shared the sequence on the 10th January with the world and a lot of companies initiated their vaccine development based on the sequencing. So the sequencing was shared through a TRISA. It's called Global Initiative for Sharing All Influenza Data. So this is the hub. You can get all the influenza viruses sequence and also now COVID-19 viruses as well as RSV. And uh, sharing the proofs and diagnosis kits, we did that for, from China CDC, it works very well. And uh, oh, more importantly, through the New England Journal of Medicine on the um, January 29th last year, we shared the epidemiological parameters. You know, what is the uh, uh, transmission route what is the incubation period? So it looks like everything's right. Even from the very beginning, within 10 days, we got all the data right. Meanwhile, while we are working so hard for the control of the pandemic, we got some information epidemic. The scientists were attacked, assaulted because of this euphemic. So euphemic is caused by euphemic. I unnamed it because of euphemic. I think Dr. Tony Fauci from the US, he agreed with me, let's call this pathogen for the euphemic as euphorus. And uh, more importantly, we have a new science. This is the science to study the euphemic. It's called euphemiology. Remember that that's not only for the COVID-19, it's for everything because the social media, and we have the social media there, everybody can see whatever they want. And the information and the misinformation mixed together, it's very hard for you to distinguish which one is real, which one is rumor. So bear in mind, we should work together, not only get the COVID-19 down, we also need to get the euphemic down. Um, you know, from the very beginning, uh, based on the science, we got the answer from science, we need to, you know, share all the data um, with Peter Hobby from Oxford, Fred, uh, Frederick Hayden from Virginia in the US and with my colleague, Dr. Chen Wang, we, we together wrote a comment in the Lancet, January 24th, 2020, last year. So we really call for the global awareness. We, this one we call a novel coronavirus outbreak of global health concern. You know, pay more attention to the word we use, concern. That could be a global Concern. So this is a very important message based on the science. So what China has done? 
I use this, always use this uh, picture. Looks like the rest of the world, you have a lake. So why don't you have a lake? Of course, once you have a lake, you must have a place to get the water out. But because it's a lake, it's very difficult to find out the, 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 the hole where the water comes from. But in China, we did the containment from the very beginning. And then we have imported viruses uh, with uh, some patients, and we have some spray. We use this um, suppressing uh, strategy after containment of Wuhan and whole China for, for the first four months, you know, from uh, January um, until early April. So this is exactly what, what happened in China. It also looks like in the whole world, right of the world, you have a tsunami. But in China, you have a waves, wave by wave. You know, no, even a lot of people, they don't believe that China can handle this very well. I should say, if everybody learned from China, if you do something like China, of course, I think it's very difficult to copy because different countries have a different strategy and different system. And more importantly, the public understanding and public involvement is very important. I will come, come to this point later on. But that's exactly, generally speaking, what happened in China. Why? You know, we can't do that in China because we have a very strong community level public health facility. So this facility is very, very important. This I was invited by Lancet Public Health with my colleague Zhong Jie Li. We wrote something strengthening public health at the community level. You know, that's very, very important. Get the public involved, get the public uh, health at the community level not just central government level. So because this is a public health issue, it's everybody's uh, issue. You need to get everybody activated. You know, if you call wearing a mask, everybody must do that. But the problem is if you do that, a lot of countries, a lot of people, they do like to wear the um, mask. So that could be a problem. So in general, based on the science, what I would say, seeking the truth, from the very beginning. That's something we should do based on the science. And also try to do anything based on, uh, you know, pragmatic. I should say, you know, any strategy must be manipulable. If you have a good idea, you have a good suggestion, you have a good theory, but in practice, it's hard to do. I don't think you can achieve anything. So this is what I call three steps to deal with health emergency. First, science base. It's very, very important to get the answer from science. For example, this time, you know, it's unlike what happened during the SARS outbreak. From the very beginning, it took about three months for us to realize that's a virus, it's a SARS. Well, this time, of course, because of the technology development, because we are living in the 21st century. So science development is already there. So this is why though, you know, we got a lot of uh, people claimed that maybe, you know, uh, we could do something better, uh, you know, again, comparing with the 1918 pandemic. So you know, we are doing relatively very well. But the problem is, this is a really a very hard virus to get, to get it done. So size base is very important. Second, public understanding, public involvement, com public complement of whatever you have. And uh, this is the second step to get the public activated. Third part, administration decision. You got to have, you know, the administration or the you know, political will into practice. So the, the pragmatic measures, it can be done. So this is you generally call science seeking the truth by size. And then for the administration, you need to do some pra pragmatic, you know, manipulable. Those three steps are very, very important. I think that will lay the base for the future preparedness. Of course, um, what happened in China, I think now in China, we are in an accurate suppression or accurate mitigation stage. You know, from the very beginning, what we did is a containment. And then for one and a half year, we, ha we, are, we have been doing for all this suppression. So whenever you have a spring coming out, we will you know, do the worker mode and get it done. But now we are doing more accurate. We also hope we can open a little bit for the border. 
but you know, we are discussing all those strategies. They are all dynamic. So you really need to have these dynamic strategies. So, so after that, you know, a lot of euphematic um, uh, uh, problem, a lot of problem of the complaint and the scientists were attacked. And also, you know, a lot of people, they think they are really scientists and have a guess for the origins, man-made and lab leakage and so many things. But the problem is we need to unite it together. And then a lot of publications claiming, so well, this is the virus, they are from bats. This is the virus, they are from Hungary. This is a virus, they are from some animals, but no one which it. But for now, almost two years, we have no answer, no answer at all for the origin of such a virus. When you think about it, for the professionals, what we have here, COVID-19, is really a great rhino event. But for the public, uh, most of the people, they don't understand why we have such a disastrous problem or event, because they think this is a black swan. But I was a member of the GPMB, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, and headed by Gro Brotland, uh, the former Norway, Norwegian Prime Minister, former DG of WHO. And the year 2019, remember, it's 2019, before COVID, annual reports, we claimed flu, coronavirus, most likely will be the virus causing pandemic or at least epidemic. Human beings, we are not ready. Our preparedness is not there. That's our re annual report. I want to remind you that so-called famous event 201. So I was invited by the Gates Foundation, uh, the World Economy uh, Forum, and also George Hopkins uh, University on January 18th, 2019. We had a uh, uh, table exercise they called Event 201. There, we pretended we have a new virus, we have a new disease. The disease was named CAPS, Coronavirus Associated Pneumonia Syndrome. That's an exercise. Virus was originated from Brazil, from pigs, and then eventually spread to human beings. It took about six months, six months, half a year, CAPS becoming a pandemic. You know, caps sounds like COVID-19. And when you think hard, you know, though I'm a DG for China CDC, I'm a scientist. I'm doing a lot of research for emerging pathogens, including coronavirus in 2016. And uh, me and my colleague, we wrote a, a paper. Um, it's called Epidemiology Genetic recombination and pathogenesis of coronaviruses. There we claim it is likely not a matter of if, but when the next recombinant coronavirus will cause human infection. So because we know the coronavirus, the characteristics of coronavirus, the frequent recombination piece by piece to exchange from one virus to another. So because we have so many coronaviruses, all those birds flying in the sky, they carry coronavirus. All those birds swimming uh, in the river, in the water, sea and the river, they carry the virus. All the virus running in the land, they carry the virus. All those virus that charge to recombine together, they change chain pieces by pieces. So this is why we claim, we think we might have this problem. So for the origin of this virus, let me remind you, Everybody remember the SARS, which emerged in 202. And also the first human infected coronavirus is called h cov 229 Two years later, we found O43. And then 204, we have h cov ol 63 The same year, we have hk one But for the hk one though, it's first identified in 209, or 204, but retrospectively, we know this virus in Brazil, in some stored uh, samples in the freezer, you have a HK1 in 1995. Of course, you have MERS, you have COVID-19. Now we have two more, it's confirmed as uh, detected in human beings. You have seven plus two already. You know, by the time, if all the scientists working together, we might have some more. So this is directly the origin. 
But you think about the origin of our Mars, it's from bad dormitory to human being. So that's a cycle. I will remind you about the origin of the influenza virus. Influenza virus were carried by all these uh, flying birds, by greater birds, and then they jumped into chicken, and then they from chicken to pig. Pigs is a mixing vessel for the chicken or avian flu, and mixed with some other flus, then you have a new strain come out. And then you find human beings. If ever you have virus, you find human beings, that will be avian flu. Of course, um, Rupert Onis in the US CDC, they uh, sequence some virus from best flu like viruses. So that, that took about six, more than 60 years to figure out the origin of the flu viruses. Now I want to come to vaccine development. Based on science, what we can do, given a vaccine. Vaccine help us to eradicate, already eradicated smallpox. Vaccine help us eradicated a second virus, rinderpest. Of course, these are two viruses by using vaccination. So believe science, believe in science, believe in scientists, believe in public health. We can get the virus eradicated. Seven strategies for the vaccine development in the world, inactivated vaccines and live attenuated vaccines, protein subunit vaccines, virus vector vaccine like adeno or flu vector, and then DNA vaccine, mRNA vaccine, virus-like particles. In general, we have those three, but those seven strategies. But in China, at the moment, we have seven vaccine approved, and two of them are approved by the WHO. So five inactivated vaccine, one um, uh, protein subunit vaccine, the other one is vector bond. Uh, no, the vector, um, uh, it's a, you know, adenovirus vectored um, uh, vaccines. And while we are working so hard, now we have the, you know, the virus, we have the variants. With those variants, you know, the releases for the virus at home, I call it a law, it's always eternal game between Tom and Jerry. So we have so many uh, virus strains. So There's a name, they give a lot of names, even they use, uh, now we are by, uh, recommended by WHO, we are using the uh, um, uh, Greek letter, you know, I hope 24 Greek letters will be enough, but we are expecting some more VOCs. Now we are worried because we have these VOCs, we are, our vaccine works, that's for sure. Four levels for uh, vaccine uh, protection, prevent infection, prevent yonis, prevent transmission, prevent a serious, a serious uh, de uh, condition or death. At least we know the vaccine provided for you for the basic uh, immunity, at least prevent from serious, serious illness and death. You might have a breakthrough infection, but definitely that will well. That will reduce the burden of diseases, BOD. And remember, size, uh, do a good job. Now we have mRNA vaccine. So mRNA vaccine revolutionize our understanding of the biology. I encourage people and especially young scientists, young generation, try to you know, work very hard for the technology of mRNA, not only for the uh, vaccine, but also for you know, other diseases. You could use genetic disorder, rare diseases, and uh, also metabolic uh, diseases. So I'm calling sharing the vaccine. If the world does not share the vaccine, viruses will take on the world. They will share the earth. So let's work together really to, to share the vaccine. That's an important message I want to deliver. So no one is safe until everyone is safe. So get vaccinated. And um, drug development, meanwhile, by using science, Vax, you know, we develop so many drugs, you could use antibodies, small molecules, and also Chinese herbs. Give you an example. Now for Ally Lili and the Junshi, and this is they have antibody, it's from my own group actually. Ally Lili made it available in Europe, in the US. So that's monoclonal antibodies already in clinical use, not trial, already in clinical use. And uh, Merck and Pfizer, claim they have new small molecule uh, uh, drugs. And um, in my group, that's an example. Even the Chinese herbs, we found some of the Chinese herbs, they have some um, active 
um, component. One of them is called dupamtin. Dupamtin is from streptomyces. They, through the uh, absorption, they get into the uh, Chinese herbs. And also, finally, I'm calling one world, one health. Let's protect our world, our earth by protect the environment, protect animals, protect human beings. Finally, Louis Pasteur said, hey guys, it's the microbes who has the final say. While I'm seeing about that, now the virus, COVID-19 virus, expanded its own territory. Here on the top, you can see, we have so many uh, animals. They are the either zero positive or they already have sequence for the virus. Here in the lab, all those virus, they are susceptible for this virus. So be careful. We might have some diseases. The disease could be called disease X. Thank you. Thank you very much. George, thank you so much for your typically energetic um, uh, presentation. You took us into so many different dimensions of the pandemic from the basic science through to the uh, epidemic of misinformation that has so plagued us. Thank you so much. You've given us a, a, a fantastic opportunity to uh, interrogate the past uh, 18 months in the question and answer session. Now our third and final speaker today, um, it's a great pleasure also to introduce Professor Helen Herman, um, who's going to give a perspective from the point of view of mental health. Helen is a psychiatrist and a public health physician. She is the immediate past president of the World Psychiatric Association. And most importantly, if I may say from my point of view, she's been a fantastic leader of a Lancet uh, World Psychiatric Association Commission on Depression that will be published in February next year. So Helen, uh, it's, a, it's wonderful to see you, wonderful to introduce you, uh, and we're looking forward very much to your presentation. And keep those questions to the audience, keep those questions in mind. Over to you, Helen. Thank you for the invitation to join this special occasion. I will be addressing the question of will COVID-19 finally change worldviews on mental health? I'll be considering first the implications of COVID-19 and the pandemic for the future of mental health, but also beyond that, considering how good mental health can become a driver rather than a potential or even incidental outcome of health and social action in the post-pandemic world. So I'll begin with uh, considering mental health and mental ill health and COVID around the world and the social determinants of mental health, and then move on to mental health and public health really joining forces for mutual benefits from their work based on community supports and partnerships and their role in the recovery from the pandemic. Mental health has become a prominent uh, topic of conversation and concern as people everywhere live through the pandemic and its consequences. Yet over time, it's been a curiously neglected topic in public health action and health care uh, everywhere. Advocates have been urging governments and other funders to act on mental ill health because of the enormous toll it exacts to act on moral and economic grounds, as well as considering the need for good mental health to tackle other health and communal problems. As others hope in other fields, people in mental health wonder whether the pandemic will make the calls for change irresistible. And uh, particularly as people and populations are facing the pandemic, and the multiple changes, including the climate emergency and social inequities that are ahead of us and beyond the pandemic. There's been attention to mental health as mentioned and the United Nations produced a policy brief on mental health in the early months of 2020, calling for redress of the historic underinvestment in mental health. 
to reduce the immense suffering of hundreds of millions of people and to mitigate the long-term social and economic costs to society. In addition, the UNICEF State of the World's Children Report for the first time ever addressed mental health and their comment included that despite the widespread demand for responses that promote, protect and care for children's mental health, investment remains negligible. So people's views on what is mental health vary around the world and they also vary according to whether a person lives with mental ill health or perhaps has a family member for whom they take caring responsibilities and experience the isolation sometimes that accompanies that. But the World Health Organization has described um, mental health as a state of well-being in which the person can cope with the stresses of life and contribute to his or her community. And most health professionals now would regard the mental and physical health as inseparable and mental health in a way that's analogous with general health as more than the absence of disease. And the attributes of mental health, uh, some of them are universal, although the expression of mental health varies from culture to culture and across various parts of the world. But at the core, there's a consensus that the social connections between people within families and communities and societies, that this social connection is universal or a universal core for mental health. And some indigenous populations around the world extend that connection to the land on which they live so that social and emotional and spiritual well-being encompassed. And while these connections are the foundations for a community life built on human rights, disrupting these connections is a central feature of the pandemic and a consequence of the upheavals in family and working life as well as the direct effects of the infection during the pandemic. So turning now to mental ill health, there's a, a very high burden of disability associated with the mental disorders and mental ill health. Uh, depression is now known as the leading cause of disability worldwide and alcohol use disorder, another high disability condition. And other mental health conditions or mental disorders, including anxiety and dementia, for example, common and high causes of disability, as well as some of the more severe and less common conditions, such as psychosis. And there's now uh, fairly clear evidence and opinion that mental health in populations has worsened during the pandemic. There's been an increase in people seeking help in uh, emergency health settings in primary health care and in specialist mental health services, as well as studies from various parts of the world have shown increases in mood and anxiety disorders, as well as other conditions. And there's likely to be a significant impact on physical and mental morbidity for some time, as well as mortality. And the pattern of change has more or less followed the expected path based on the experience in previous pandemics or emergencies, where the population is adversely affected. Initially, many people adapt, but a significant minority, particularly those already at disadvantage or with existing problems, have longer lasting conditions. With the pandemic, in addition, we've now clear evidence that severe mental disorders and substance use disorders place people at high risk of COVID infection and at risk of a severe course of disorder and death as well. The COVID-19 mental disorders collaborators uh, from the Global Burden of Disease Consortium published a systematic review in the Lancet Journal this month that looked at the disability adjusted life years or the global burden of disability related to anxiety and depression. They estimated that in 2020, there were an additional 50 million cases of major depression and uh, 60 to 90 million cases of anxiety 
representing about a 25% increase in both. You'll see that in the uh, diagram that the horizontal axis shows the disability adjusted life years and the vertical axis shows the age groups with the orange and mauve colors showing the additional burden of disability associated with anxiety and depression. You'll also see from this diagram the typical uh, bulge in young people of the burden of disability related to mental disorders. And in this, the uh, distinction between mental ill health and ill health related to other non-communicable diseases. The epidemiology of mental disorders is behind this with the peak incidence of uh, disorders being in young people and the onset between the years of 15 and 24 years higher than in other age groups. So that 75% of people with lifetime psychiatric disorders experience the onset before 25 years of age. So the major determinants of mental ill health are very similar to those for health in general, absolute and relative poverty, relative social disadvantage in particular, gender inequality, the violence that often goes with that, and social exclusion related to discrimination, as well as major physical illness that frequently accompanies uh, mental ill health, particularly in older people. The publication World Mental Health in 1995 identified cycles of social disadvantage, poverty, violence, discrimination, the interaction of health, mental health and behaviour, creating high risks for mental ill health, and that in turn creating additional barriers to health and livelihood, perhaps the precursor to the concept of syndemics. And these conditions becoming more and more frequent as we think of the growth of uh, informal settlements and slums in cities around the world, poor rural settings, and the millions of people on the move in the world as refugees, asylum seekers. And these conditions are increased during the pandemic, uh, particularly when combined with other emergencies such as the climate change and um, economic difficulties and conflict. And as UNICEF points out, a child on the move is a child in danger. So the global mental health treatment gap has been remarked as a, a uh, agenda for global mental health. The conditions of life just described are also problematic for general health and intervening in general health, but seem to be much stronger, much uh, more significant for mental health worldwide. The effective treatments that we have are not widely available, whether we're in high income countries or middle and low income countries. And they're particularly uh, unavailable in impoverished and emergency settings. But efforts to respond to the treatment gap in scarce resource settings have been strong over the last 15 years or so, particularly task sharing with local health workers and communities uh, and the engagement of mental health with collaborative care and universal health care. And the disease control priorities um, edition related to mental neurological and substance use disorders has analyzed the evidence to consider best practices beyond the health setting as well at population levels. They find that it's important to restrict access to means of suicide, including pesticides in some regions of the world and reducing the availability of and demand for alcohol is a, a, a critical move. At the community level, life skills training in schools to give young men and women social and emotional competencies is important for their future. And at the healthcare level, supporting self-care and including mental health in primary care and community outreach. So there is evidence for 
effective interventions, the time to deliver the World Health Organization high-level report on non-communicable diseases in mental health, published in 2018, shows uh, evidence-based synergies in the prevention, treatment and care for mental and physical ill health. And the importance of intervening across the life cycle, particularly in childhood in youth, to intervene in families and schools to promote social and emotional well-being and avoid the uh, violence and uh, discrimination and poverty that will damage mental health. And it's become more evident that addressing trauma and associated mental health problems is important for the effective delivery of health and welfare services, as well for working in schools and criminal justice systems and the substance abuse and mental health services administration in the USA has made that very plain over the recent years. So the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development reframed mental health. It considered the social and biological determinants of mental health problems and their interaction over the life course and the role of both nature and nurture in mental ill health and defined mental health as a fundamental human right for everybody, especially for those whose mental health is at risk or already impaired. And the agenda for mental health was expanded from reducing the treatment gap to include promoting mental health and reducing the burden of mental and substance use disorders through considering the prevention and the quality gaps. The key messages of the Commission are that cost-effective solutions to mental health care exist as well as mental health can be improved through interventions beyond the health sector. And conversely, that without action on mental health, the sustainable development goals cannot be met. The World Health Organization's Comprehensive Action Plan was renewed this year to extend to 2030. And one of its four main objectives is to implement strategies for promotion and prevention in every country. And the targets for this include every country or 80% of countries having at least two multi-sectoral mental health promotion and prevention programs, and that uh, the rate of suicide will be reduced by one third across the world. And that again, 80% of countries will have a system for psychosocial preparedness for emergencies and disasters. Despite all of this, uh, mental health expenditure by governments and other funders has not risen and remains at a very low and dismal level. So on average, there's no more than 2% of government budgets for health devoted to mental health. 1% of global development assistance for health is the maximum. And no more than 4% of global health research funding is expended on mental health. And very little of that is devoted to low and middle income countries or spent on the evaluation of public health interventions. So considering the <clears throat> pandemic and mental health, the pandemics overall has highlighted the relevance of social determinants for mental as well as physical ill health. And conversely, it shows how mental health is relevant for health and social development, in fact, critical to these. The pandemic has brought the increases in social inequities and adversities. And in a vicious cycle, there are higher infection and mortality rates among people in the socially and economically disadvantaged populations, as well as among those with pre-existing mental and physical disorders. And the concept of syndemics has been invoked to consider the escalation beyond comorbidity across environment, uh, society and health. In addition, we uh, can consider the uh, almost universal debates and uh, distress that relate to the enforced isolation that comes with public health measures to contain the pandemic as well as the loss of work, the loss of income, 
the loss of education for school children and young people. And then the distress and uh, poor mental health related to the infodemics, the uh, amount of uh, information, some of which is misleading or, or indeed untrue, uh, relating in particular to the treatments and to uh, the vaccination against um, COVID. So public health and mental health, however, uh, these fields are gaining common ground. And this has been accelerated by the pandemic. These fields remained alienated through much of the last century, even as we watched public health and cardiology come together. For instance, heart health improved um, uh, markedly through the combination, combined work of these fields, but mental health is not catching up. And we need to see now practitioners, researchers and policymakers in both fields uh, working along with people with lived experience of mental ill health and their families and making sure that mental health is fully integrated in health and social policy and practice and evaluating the mutual benefits of doing this. So what are the benefits that are based on evidence? Well, first, there's mental health integrated in health policies and practice and the World Health Organization Commission report time to deliver shows the evidence-based synergies with mental and physical health interventions as mentioned. And mental health specific um, programs such as the Thinking Healthy program in India and program where uh, young women in rural settings deliver psychosocial interventions to reduce the risk of perinatal depression and mental health being integrated in the planning and worth work of other sectors such as education, family, urban planning, justice. This um, in schools can be seen to result in better education, particularly the improvement of school climates, less disruptive behaviour and better mental health. Community development in cities, the well-known Communities that Care program has over the last um, 20 years or more been responsible for reducing delinquency and violence in cities across the world. All of this work is based on or requires the community support and partnerships that are the foundation of public health work. And in relation to the combined work, this means that people in communities uh, appreciate the value of mental health and the possibilities for improving it. And that's our combined job, the mental health and public health workforce. And there are innovations that are spurred on by the pandemic to add value, such as the digital technologies that extend the reach of professional and peer support. Uh, predictive models, such as those we use for uh, designing policies related to the pandemic, the infection itself, uh, combining economic, social and medical data can assist forecasting and policy and service development for mental health. And people in different places learning from each other, for instance, the friendship bench, a concept for grandmothers providing support to uh, the mental health of people in villages has been imported from Zimbabwe to New York City. To conclude by thinking about uh, the importance of champions, these two young women have shown the way in supporting local and global action on climate and education. And we have champions for mental health as well, but overall the importance of community development and the empowerment of women and men uh, that underpins it is critical to the solving the, the uh, problems that need to be solved. So community development involves community members taking action on things important to them, it can be supported by science and outside expertise that assist the strengthening the capacity of communities to respond to mental health needs. But this can also underpin science-based policy. But this community development requires the empowerment or participation 
uh, which in turn requires self-confidence. And self-confidence is a, an important component of good mental health. So there's a circularity between empowerment, participation, self-confidence and good mental health that in turn allow uh, communities to tackle social and health goals and, uh, and major problems such as maternal and child health and violence and alcohol use. And so I could conclude by saying that mental health is everyone's business. Integrating mental health in public health and social policy is critical for the future of those who live with mental ill health, as well as to the global and national recoveries from the pandemic and beyond. And we've seen uh, during the pandemic in particular, we've seen worldviews on climate change and the macroeconomic policies of governments around the world change dramatically. And can we expect that mental health will be next? Thank you. Helen, thank you so much. That was uh, a fabulous um, call to action uh, on mental health. Uh, and seeing, and this is very optimistic, seeing the pandemic as actually an opportunity for us to tell the story of mental health again and integrate it across, as you say, public health. Now, this is an opportunity for us to think of some questions. And I'm going to go, first of all, to Francis, because I know, Francis, you would like to pose the first question to get the conversation going. So, Francis, over to you. Am I on? Sorry, am I on? You are. Yes, oh, hi, thanks. thanks everyone for those really elucidating talks. I was really interested to hear that all of you made the point that public health and mental health all need uh, local mitigation. And, you, and two of you talked about WHO policy. So I was wondering what you think are the realistic prospects for WHO having more global influence in the future so that we can be more joined up globally about handling these now global problems. So maybe she did, you want to go first? Um, yes, thank you. Th thank you for that question. I I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists for really wonderful summaries of and very thoughtful summaries of the situation. Um, there is an active discussion going on right now and uh, ministers of health will be meeting at the end of this month to talk about WHO's strength and role in uh, pandemic preparedness and, um, and response. And particularly to strengthen WHO's, uh, within the WHO framework, the mutual responsibilities, obligations of member states in areas such as sharing data um, and of course the very, <clears throat> and, and preventing cross-border transmission essentially of uh, infectious diseases. And a very important question of sharing capacities, sharing uh, tools that are needed to jointly address a pandemic. So I, I believe what's been decided is that there is a need for a stronger instrument or even a treaty where WHO will coordinate global action by member states for more openness, for better reporting, for providing some incentives to work together collectively, and even thinking about some sanctions for member states that don't play their role. So we, we've had the experience of a framework convention on tobacco control, where WHO coordinates actions by member states to, uh, to act in certain ways. Certainly there are many lessons that led there about the challenges uh, that, that, might, um, that might be there. Another issue that's needed and linked to this is to do with financing. There's been a lot of discussion already coming out about financing for mental health. You know, we, we need ways in which member states can report on what they're doing and be able to say to each other, you need to be doing better with WHO coordinating this process on some agreed outcomes. And I think, I certainly think mental health deserves this kind of attention because again, we've learned that 
outbreaks are important for economies. I think we underestimate very much the importance of mental health, not only for the well-being of people and families, but also for contribution to economies and the cost that it has to economies. So it's going to be possibly a treaty that may take some time to negotiate how member states might, must be accountable to each other, sanctions. Um, I think we need to do better at naming and shaming and making sure that we know which are the countries that are playing their part and which are not, and really to stick closely to the principle of equity, because that's also at the center of accepting to, to do things together. Thanks, JD. Um, Helen, did you want to comment on the role of WHO and then I'll come to George? Yes, well, thank you very much. And like Shidi, I'd like to thank her and uh, George very much as well for their presentations um, and leadership in, in this time for us all. Uh, I, I see that WHO is uh, a critical leader, uh, encouraging governments to um, have their have mental health included in its public health action and health care. We think that we've uh, defeated alienation um, when we've closed asylums in some parts of the world, but in fact, it remains in full force. And WHO's leadership, as in their mental health action plan, I believe is critical. And we hope that is apparent in the months or even more apparent in the months ahead of us as we deal with the pandemic. Thanks, Helen. George? Yes, I think WHO is very, very important. You know, because we have such a diversified world at the moment, we really need some organization like the United Nations and WHO, you know, all those international organizations. However, in my opinion, especially after the, is, of course, we are still experiencing this pandemic. We need a stronger uh, WHO by addressing more all the emerging infectious diseases. You know, for all those uh, non-communicable diseases, um, all the, you know, the, 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 the local government and the national government, they can do a good job. But for the EID, because as I said, there's no border for the virus, no uh, visa uh, to be applied. They just travel anywhere. But this is just a slogan. We have a slogan there. Where's the real action? So in my opinion, by addressing this, the stronger WHO would at least double or you know, redouble the numbers of the staff or the, the you know, scientists working on the EID instead of any other diseases. Of course, any other disease is very, very important, but the problem is those can be addressed you know, slowly. But EID like this one, you cannot really wait. So that's my opinion. Equity is, uh, I think, like Helen mentioned, equity is very, very important. We need this, you know, the equity. Now, for this equity can only be implemented, or can only be achieved by the coordination, or sometimes we call it leadership of the WHO. Without that, how can you get this equity? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, George. I think that's exactly right. Um, I mean, I think the challenge is that what the pandemic has shown, unfortunately, is that there isn't a very strong appetite for multilateralism, strong multilateralism. Um, what we saw was 190 plus separate responses to the pandemic rather than a properly coordinated global response. Um, partly, without naming any names, uh, that was because of some particularly vocal um, political leaders who uh, decided to take a shot at WHO, which was, um, you know, really quite remarkable and um, really undermined the organization. And in a sense, one of the responses is going to have to be to rebuild a sense of multilateralism, um, a sense that we need to have global institutions that can respond. Now, I want to address a, another question here, which um, has affected all all of us and that's and one or two of you have mentioned this but i want to try and get to grips with what we can do about it you've all emphasized the contribution that science has made and and i of course working at a medical journal i absolutely agree with you so the scientific community globally 
um, has performed way above expectations in delivering accurate information, in shaping the response to the pandemic. But, but the truth is that the, amongst the public, there has been a significant proportion of people who have not trusted the science, indeed have promoted disinformation, um, and have fueled most recently a very influential anti-vaccination movement that in some countries has really damaged, is really damaging the response. So my question to the three of you is, how do we in all humility in the science community and the health community, how do we deal with this epidemic of misinformation? Um, who would like to begin uh, with that, it's a, it seems to me one of the toughest questions that we have to reflect on um, in science. Maybe I could go to um, Helen first. Yes, oh, thank you, Richard. This is something I think um, is uh, uh, people are pondering, aren't they? And mm. one one uh, approach to it is to think: what are the roots of this um, uh, this such a vigorous um, anti-vaccine, anti-communal um, or anti-authority uh, reaction. And the, we could say, well, people are frightened, people are very scared, particularly in the early periods in the pandemic and uh, looking for, looking for, um, for ways to uh, overcome that, looking for comfort. But then there's, um, in addition to that, people are angry. People, uh, and again, the inequity is is part of that. That we're not the gov many uh, influential figures in governments and internationally have been saying we're all in this together. But in fact, we're not. That um, the the have not so much worse off than they were, um, and. Uh, it, it, this, I think, is fueling a lot of it so that the various movements get confused. In our country, we've had, or in our state here in Australia, we've had trade unionists um, becoming active against mandates for vaccine for being able to work. And that's being um, joined up with um, people who are anti-vaxxer or have, have uh, extreme political views. Thanks, Helen. Um, George, any reflections on misinformation? Yes, uh, Richard. Um, in my opinion, you know, for the information and disinformation, especially, I already touched a little bit in my yes. talk about this, uh, you know, euphemic and the euphemic. So, in my opinion, at least, uh, I think to answer your question, at least two parts. The first one. Of science is very important. Everybody realizes that. The problem is sometimes the scientists are good at seeing the truth and dig out the truth. They are not good to communicate with the public. So they try to insist on whatever they think is right. But for the public, sometimes they know you are right, but they just got some misinformation or disinformation. They can't distinguish the disinformation, misinformation from the information, right information. So that's the problem. So in my opinion, first, we need the scientists to learn. At least they should try to understand why and how those public, they have the vaccine hesitancy, they are anti-vaccination. So try to find out the communication skills. This is something the scientists should learn, communication skills. That's the first, um, you know, uh, strategy. I thought we should, you know, try to tackle this disinformation or euphemic. The second, we need a kind of a strong leadership. You know, from that sense, especially by this time, we need someone, the leader, who know at least who knows the science, at least they understand the science at least a little bit. But from time to time, you know, people think, you know, you can use the detergent. A drink the detergent can kill the COVID-19 virus, something like that. So strong leadership. That means uh, how strong it is. You try someone, the scientists or the persuaded something, 
they did something under the pressure something, but they try to communicate something, communication, and then you know coordination. Now we need strong leadership. The leaders, the leaderships, and especially the like I said, for example, in China, at the community level, community level leadership, not just a bigger one, because the public they are in the community. All your public, they are in the community. So this is why I need, we need some, you know, propaganda stuff. They go and talk to someone in the community level. That's, that's what I mean, you know, by the leadership and by, um, by the communication by the scientists. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe it's a combination of what you're suggesting, the local leadership and what Helen said at the end of her talk about the importance of champions. Trust, it doesn't always have to be scientists. It can be members of civil society who are trusted by communities who are also um, promulgators of public health mess messages. Shidi, from your point of view on misinformation, has this been a big problem in uh, WHO Afro? Um, yes, it has. I mean, it, it has in some countries been a, a big problem. Yeah. And the inequities have driven it. You know, it started off with, well, as usual, African people will be uh, guinea pigs for the development of vaccines that they will not then get access to. So that's fueled the whole sense of aggrievement even before things started to, to develop. I agree very much with uh, the, the, the idea that scientists need to, we scientists, technical people, politicians even need to communicate simply, understandably. If I ever hear another politician say non-pharmaceutical protocols, <laughs> you know, so that those and those phrases just trip off our tongues yeah. all the time on television. It's like, what is that one? And yeah. secondly, I agree also that we need to send out the message through different people, including trusted community-based um, leaders, if you like, in churches, in women's groups. In Africa, people are very organized in associations. Those are the kinds of people that need to be playing a role as well in carrying a message. And then thirdly, in WHO, we've established with our communications team an infodemic alliance with uh, some of the social media companies that actually track and follow. What are people saying? What messages are being spread among certain groups? And then finally, I think we have to accept, even in Africa, the ideology, politics got involved in this. You know, so that, so sometimes what I've seen globally is that some political positions predict what yeah. people will decide about vaccines. That's really frightening and we need to understand how to get around that. Okay, thanks, Shidi. Now I've got a great question from uh, one member of our audience. It's from Professor Tom Solomon, who's the incoming Academy of, Me Academy of Medical Sciences, um, Vice President International. Um, and Tom asks really, the, the question that we all need to be asking actually, um, and it's a difficult one to answer, but we have to answer it. Um, so he asks this, why do you think the global response went so badly wrong? Politicians and others said the right things in terms of equity, sharing resources, vaccines and so on, but they failed to deliver. Were they being cynical? So. Where did we go so badly wrong? Over 12 million deaths, um, many of those preventable. Now, who's going to start with that? Maybe I start with George first. Um, I think this is a very complicated question. <laughs> yes. First, first, you know, this virus is very, very special. This is why when I delivered my recorded uh, lecture, I said, we should try to trust our mother nature. You know, that could be very broad. Why is something wrong here? Because we, the human beings, we believe we are kind of almost, we are, we are the gods. But in fact, we have our limitation to conquer the earth. So we thought we can always can change a lot on the earth. But in the, in the end, you know, we used so much uh, resources from the nature. And then we have a climate change, the blah, blah, you know, that could be very broad. Why so wrong could be very broad. Okay, now I would come back with the public health alone. A public, like I already said, public health alone, you cannot do anything because you are dealing with the issue for the population. 
not for the individual. Once you are dealing something for the population, you need the coordination, you need the leadership. So at the moment, Richard, can I ask you, where is the coordination leadership? Yeah. You know, in addition, except for the WHO, so we don't have a very strong leadership or coordination here. Even, we even don't have the communication. So this is the problem. I think this time with the, we should, what we should learn. First, tolerance. We mm -hmm. should tolerate to the, you know, whatever we have and the nations, different, the whole international uh, communities, we, we should try to tolerate each other. And second, mm -hmm. resilience. You know, the resilience is very, very important. And the third, open-minded vision. We got to be open-minded. So that's also, you know, for the public health, you are talking something about public. It's not mm -hmm. individual health. From time to time, we always put our effort in the individual health, not really public health. Though we are talking about public health, but we are doing something for the individual. Individual here means really individual, person by person, or means national. The nationalism is there, like you said, uh, Richard, you said multilateralism is not there. Yeah. Oh, they got the challenge. Yeah. yeah, and thirdly, in terms of the trans, um, uh, transformation science, because we have the science here, and uh, we haven't done very good to transfer our science into yeah. the pragmatic, I call it pragmatic practice, that yeah. i.e. you got to have some strategy. It's, it's manipulable. You got very good things, like you, know, you mentioned from the very beginning of the question, like the, 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 the politicians, they have the slogan, yeah. sharing the resources, sharing yeah. the vaccines, where's the delivery? Yeah. So, you know, that's my comment, I think, by the end, through this one, I would like um, Richard, you should buy the land seat and by doing some, some kind of discussion for that. Thank you. Thanks very much, George. Um, Shidi, uh, what's your view about this? Um, you're sitting there um, presiding over WHO Afro. It must have been so frustrating to see the the failure of a truly global, globally coordinated response. Where did it go wrong? Yes, it, it has been really. And I mean, when thinking about it, I, I wasn't sure whether it was the coincidence of the political process in some of the wealthy countries and the, the shock that these countries had in not being able to overcome this problem as had, would be expected. And, and, and I think that the, the political vulnerabilities that that caused, because in virtually all countries, it was possible to criticize the government and be right about some of the criticism. Some, there are very few countries in which things uh, went well from the beginning. So I, I believe that the, the, the politics became very acutely sensitive okay. and the imperative to do whatever for your own population while saying, yes, of course, we will as usual, you know, in the multilateral sense, work with others, just became a pattern of behavior because it was possible everywhere to say the government messed up on this and in yeah. some way or other there would be gaps. It was a new, uh, extraordinary experience globally. That still, I think, uh, needs further reflection. So next time, what is it that needs to happen so it doesn't happen like this? I've said to my colleagues, well, in all our scenario building, we have to factor this into one of the risks Having worked on, on global problems before, well, I, I would have never thought the case. And you know, if, if I think back to the HIV situation, which I referred to, and the access to antiretrovirals, what was lacking also was the sympathy from populations in these wealthy countries, which I found shocking. You know, in the past with HIV, we had very strong population support for equity and access. I remember the, the, the partnership between groups of men in Western countries and people in Africa who needed access to treatment. That's been missing. So that, that human element, communities telling their own, own politicians, listen, you need to be doing differently on our behalf. We don't agree with this behavior, which is not matching your statements. I found that surprisingly missing. Mm. So we, we need to 
perhaps find ways to reconnect <laughs> even better than we have. Thanks, Judy. And Helen, from your point of view in Australia, of course, Australia, Australia's government has had its own challenges, not least over the vaccine program. From where you're sitting, um, where do you see some of the particular um, failures in the response? Well, uh, yes, it's hard to go beyond the comments about uh, multilateralism that we that we've had the um, coincidence of the pandemic and a period, um, quite a period before that, where where the global order was changing quite markedly, quite dramatically, and the um, the coincidence really of, of the debates about climate, the climate emergency, and um, the economic emergencies, where been emerging from the economic shocks of the two thousand and eight. Uh, uh, financial crisis. But one of the, the, the things that has changed so dramatically has been the macroeconomic approaches. Here in Australia, the government spends, spend, 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 and um, yeah. that has uh, saved many livelihoods. But the, um, and that's happened in other countries as well. But there is that um, abiding, there's a, a big loss of trust here in the government. And I think this um, emphasizes the point that I think all three of us made in our presentations about the importance of um, future action being more and more strongly based on strengthening communities and working with communities and giving them the first say. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, I'd like to turn to a slightly different subject now. And this is from, uh, this question comes from Andrew Tompkins. Um, and his question is, what is the role of greater collaboration between research units and universities in resource poor countries? Um, and I think, I think what Andrew's asking there is, um, how can we elevate the voice of universities and research units? Um, how do we support their work um, to be part of the global conversation to raise issues in the global community. Um, it's been part of the inequity that voices from resource poor areas of the world have not been part of that conversation, uh, part of that response sufficiently well. Um, Shidi, perhaps I could come to you here because um, Sub-Saharan Africa has perhaps been the most marginalized voice um, of all, despite all, all the good work that you've done um, and others have done still, uh, it's very hard to get your voice heard. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I, I think from the perspective of universities, academics, where there is a lot of capacity in African, uh, African institutions, they are very much linked to financing from outside of the continent because sure. the, the, generally the solid investment in research in the institutions. I mean, African universities are struggling for financing for decades now. So it, it's, so they are very linked to and allied to their financers for internationally. So I think there needs again to be an, 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 an agreement in an international compact moving from that while we get domestic financing to be improved and while we get a better link between, you know, if, if you look at who is making statements in, in Africa, it's generally uh, politicians who have, there's a real gap we find between the governments and the academic institutions in the region. And as the region, we're trying to work to bridge that gap because that's where you get the gap between knowledge and policy and what then gets done in countries. So that also needs to be linked together somehow. I, we've seen there are, institutions at the, at the continental level. I think that could be, that could start there, that are networking some of the academics that could uh, raise the profile and the voice of academics from, from Africa. And, and this is some of, these are some of the investments that need to be made. But again, that needs a multilateral partnership and it needs space to be created by the powerful institutions in wealthier countries. Absolutely, absolutely. Helen. Yeah, I, I think this is um, 
a, an area where the countries are looking inwards, um, as, mm. at least as I see it from here. And also the university sector has been the, the one sector or one of the few sectors that, that has not been supported through the pandemic time. I don't know what the how how that has played out in other regions, but here the voice of paradoxically, as we've celebrated the successes and the higher profile of science, um, thousands of academics have been losing their jobs and uh, becoming more um, uh, beholden to to their funders um, through the universities. So, um, I, I, perhaps this is a, a a topic for yet another um, concerted uh, discussion. Yeah, um, thanks, Helen. And George, um, and you alluded to this, and certainly at the Lancet, I've seen this, the voices of scientists from Chinese universities and research institutions has been very powerful. Um, and I think in many ways, your universities have succeeded in getting their voice across in the, in, to the international community. Would you agree? Yes, you are right, Richard. I mean, in general, the voices from the Chinese universities are re well received. And I think you, know, you are right. That maybe you know, in more a more uh, effort for some developing country like in some in some area in Africa, in yeah. general, you can the the big uh, the 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 strong evidence for whatever you said earlier, Richard, is I call it saturated, saturated vaccine development and saturated research for the pandemic at the moment. You know, from a very beginning, so many academicians and uh, the researchers or professors at the university, they are actually involved. Thank you. Yes, yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to hand over to uh, Francis just in a second to close, but just as a note of optimism to end, um, I'm old enough um, to remember, of course, the SARS outbreak of 2002-2003. Um, and if you think back to that time, uh, that was a moment where Chinese science um, and medicine was not as advanced as it is now. And the Chinese government invested, has invested over the past 20 years enormously in both the health system and universities. And the response by China, if I may say very respectfully, in 2002, 2003, wasn't the best. But the response, I think, from where I sit, in 2020 and 21 has been superlative in terms of the research and the communication to the international community. In 20 years, you can turn things around when governments are committed to the importance of science and medicine in their communities and their societies. So I think that's a big lesson from the pandemic, um, that over one generation, you can make a difference if governments take science and medicine seriously. Um, Francis, I'm gonna hand over to you. I'd just like to personally thank our three wonderful speakers um, for taking us into these perspectives. Um, thanks so much. Um, thanks to the Academy. Thanks to everybody who's uh, made this possible. And Francis, you have the very last word. Well, thanks very much, Richard. And thanks everyone for that really interesting discussion. I think we have come back away with some lessons, well, certainly with some reflections and maybe some lessons learned from all this. And I guess uh, two of them are rather um, challenges. And one of them is that I think we do really need to rebuild respect for the WHO and hope that that does happen in the, in the upcoming negotiations. Um, I think the, the remarks about leaders were very interesting. That's clearly been, we've been um, sort of, um, subject to what leaders have uh, been in power during this period. And we've been see, noted the need for humility in some and courage in others. And I'm not sure how much we can do about that except continue to vote. Um, but finally, I think we did come away with a positive message, which is that scientists need to be working with local leadership as much as national leadership. And we need to be continuing to educate the public as much as we can. And I think that 
in a way, there's a role for the academies here. The academic um, communities are coming together in the academies, hosting events like this where we can discuss these issues and maybe disseminate them beyond just our community of academics, really important. And I hope we can have cooperation between the academies to continue to convey some of these messages throughout the world. So um, on that um, positive note, I would also like to thank our speakers. Thanks to Dr. Moeti, Professor Herman, and Professor Gao, and to The Lancet for collaborating with us to hold the lecture, and very much to Pro Professor Richard Horton for chairing, co-chairing the event. So thank you all. Thank you to, to the attendees for your questions and to the Academy and Lancet staff for supporting us in putting this on. And I'd just like to remind you finally that we will have a video of this event available on the Academy of Medical Sciences website in due course. So thank you again and have a good rest of your day, evening or morning. Thank you. <laughs>